gentlemen, welcome back to our Woody Allen retrospective right here on planettyro.com. I'm your host, as always, Donald Wonder, and I'm joined by my lovely, handsome son of a gun, Simon Rad. Wow, very complimentary today. Maybe because on this episode, we're going to talk about actual assholes in real life. Yeah, guys, you know what? We do these recordings two weeks in advance, so by the time you get to this one, maybe it's kind of blown over. Maybe not really. I hope not. Yeah. I hope it just escalated. Woody Allen, in, in, in recent news, Woody Allen has been caught up in a controversy of this Harvey Weinstein Hollywood kerfuffle where Harvey Weinstein's come out as this mass sexual offender in Hollywood, you know, it's half the Weinstein company. We're going to talk about that after the discussion and only in relation to Woody Allen because Woody Allen's been brought into the spotlight for his comments, which he really should have just stayed out of it. But we'll get to that at the end, so guys. And actually, I, even more ironically... We're going to talk about Harry Weinstein because he's mentioned in this very movie we're getting to today. But before that, guys, on our last discussion, we actually spoke about 2001's The Curse of the Jade Scorpion. If you missed that discussion and you want to go back and check that out, there'll be a link in the top right corner of the YouTube card. Do not forget, we're doing this whole Woody Allen playlist retrospective, guys, if this is your first time listening because you like this movie. We're going to entertain you with our previous discussions, guys, because you know we're just, me and Simon, we're just your average movie going folk where these are discussions they're not really reviews we're just having fun with it but casuals as you diehard Woody Allen fans like to point out and they're spoiler discussions so be aware if you were thinking about watching the movie we're going to spoil it if you want to watch it before then check it out do that if not stay tuned to our hilarious discussion and uh, on that note Simon why don't you usher us in like you always do on what this movie's about all right so uh, a bit of a light snack of a movie this time around we're in 2002, and the movie's called A Hollywood Ending. Very appropriate, right? And kind of ironic. But it's not what you think it is. It's a bit more mellow. Woody Allen, once again, I assume he would say, plays somebody completely different from him. Like oh, a complete opposite. Like, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yes, yes. Yeah, like as Woody always says, none of these characters are based on him. And you can tell from the description that him and this character are like, you know... Night and day, yeah. black and what, white. What does this guy do? Now you pull it up. Oh, oh, something it, it's different. something completely different. You would never think about Woody Allen, what I mentioned. He's a New York-based director. Oh man. Who likes jazz music, and old movies, kind mm. of European style. He mm. likes to work with foreign cameramen and do these misunderstood deep pieces, sometimes with a dramatic ending. Who's difficult to work with, apparently. Wow, <laughs> I know. It's like. Who is this guy, and how does Woody come up with these characters to play? You know, where did all this come from? <laughs> We're gonna get shit for teasing, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say something after you go. But keep going. Guess what? He's also divorced as part of a scandal, and he used to work with his old, you know, love slash wife on film. And now you're never gonna guess this, but he's dating a much younger woman. Wow, it's like <laughs> uh, Woody just like hopped into someone else's skin. This is really method acting right here. Uh. <laughs> how does he envision these characters? And uh, what I would like to know personally, how does he know so much about somebody who's so different from him? You know, it's like, how can he relate? Where did he find that one link to kind of make that connection to get into this character? So what's what he yeah what's he doing in this movie being the anyway, director, and, yeah. anyway we're, we're teasing but all the setup won't amount to much and this is this is kind of the foreshadowing so like I mentioned Woody's a troubled director the actual only difference between him and this guy is that this guy is on the down you know on the rock bottom he hasn't made a movie in years they say around ten years since his divorce. He departed from his last project, so he has a bad reputation of being difficult to work with. He's doing commercials, which in Woody's mind, because he's in Canada, he must be in a freaking snowstorm, which is how his character is introduced, which is really funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> this guy, I mean, just because you're in Canada, you don't have to be on a mountaintop covered in snow. You can find probably a different location, but mm -hmm. that was part of the commercial. So he's in a pretty bad place. He's dating this young actress who's apparently not very good, and she's in an off-Broadway, off-play, like an off-off-Broadway play, whatever that means, you know? It means that she can't do shit at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she's Translation. a trophy girlfriend. He's just fucking her. But yeah, but she's played by Deborah Messing, 
who you may remember from Will and Grace. She's a she's a very nice actress, very funny, very energetic. You yeah. know, she really brightens up the movie and makes the most out of this, you know, uh, supporting part. Then we have Tia Leone, who you might remember from Bad Boys, who, of course, is the highlight of the film. She plays the ex-wife who really kickstarts the plot. And it's what you would expect. So she's establishing herself with her new husband, who's a studio head at the fictional picture house Galaxy, you know, studio. And they're looking at a new project, and the script is based in Manhattan. But once again, shocking is somehow Woody Allen's character's Wall Waxman's specialty. I know, right? Like, wow, just all these random ideas that Woody comes up with. So, so different. And uh, she's like, my ex-husband is perfect for this. I know what everybody's thinking, but I want him to do it. And I'll make it work. Even though he's difficult, I'll make it work. And then that's where the movie kind of kicks off. So he has to do it because he's at an all-time low. And she has to do it because she has something to prove. So even though they're divorced and she having an affair with the studio head causes problems, they have kind of uh, will banter back and forth. And they follow up with the picture, and that's where most of the comedy comes in. But the big twist in the movie that this motherfucker decides that he's going to go blind. Uh, what did he call it? A psychosomatic yeah, episode? Yeah, psychosomatic blindness. It was so ridiculous. I thought it was, very, it was actually so silly that it made the movie really special, actually. Yeah, it, it is a creative idea. But that's where the movie kind of just kips over. So yeah. basically, they have to start filming the movie, and Woody's blind. The end. I mean, we're going to talk about it more, but that's basically the whole gimmick here, that he has to direct the movie blind. And I want to know what you thought about it, because to me, it didn't really pan out as the way you would think it would, or in a way that would wrap up most storylines in a satisfying way. Yeah. I feel about this movie, the way you thought about Small Town Cooks, this is just a, a very light and breezy comedy, which had the potential to be a lot more, to be honest with you, before we talk about the movie specifically, I want to talk about some other things surrounding the movie. And when before we even got to the 2000s, I said to you, I said to you that Woody's entering in a comedy if he's trying to get back into comedy. The last three or four movies he did, starting from 2000, have been all comedies. Lighthearted comedies are comedies, and nobody's liked them. The last four movies, generally, nobody likes. And as we're going to, a little bit of foreshadowing, the movie that really put him back on is a, a heavy, dark drama. So yeah, I commend Woody for trying to be comedic again, which people used to like. But now, after he's tried multiple times, just like this movie, wasn't received well at all. And actually, here's a fun fact, a very funny fact, actually, that hits the UK in particular. This is the first Woody Allen movie that did not get a theatrical release here in the UK. <laughs> like, nope. <laughs> no, thank you, Woody. This, this is just for DVD straight away. So, And... The reason why people like this movie the most is because we did make all those teas and kind of fun elements that, you know, Woody didn't stray too far from what he knows. He's practically playing another version of himself. And he did that in another movie, his fucking favorite movie, which we both don't really appreciate, Stardust Memories, where he's the opposite of this character. He's another film director, but he's worshipped, he's accomplished, and, you know, that consistently through that movie, people are praising him. But in this movie, he's more or less a washout. He sees his glory days behind him, so he's got something to prove. And then I thought to myself, okay, this is a good opportunity to see if this is meant to be a parody of how Woody Allen goes about making his movies. It could be interesting. I couldn't tell because the movie is goofy in a way where it doesn't feel like it's a satire of the movie industry. It just seems very lighthearted and not really intelligent enough to think that he really was trying to say something about the filmmaking process. This is just very goofy and lighthearted and that was what was disappointing to me because I thought this was an opportunity for him to really say something. At this point in time, in cinema, because, you know, early 2000s, Woody Allen was forgotten. People were like, ah, he's old, he's out. The last movies are kind of crap. You know, the last movie he did, people really loved. Believe it or not, it was Husbands and Wives. People didn't even like Deconstructing Harry as much as us. People looked at Woody Allen and was like, this guy's over. He's just making films a year and he's going to pass away. People never even knew he was about to have a second renaissance. And actually, I forgot to mention, this was the year I got into Woody Allen. This was his most recent movie. And again, I actually thought he was on his way out. Watching this movie, I thought, oh, this guy is old. You know, this is one of his last movies. And <laughs> ironically, another, another little bit of trivia. 
this is Woody Allen. I'm pretty sure this is his last movie as the leading main character. Because, again, people kind of had enough of the shtick of him being the main character. And his comedy just didn't work. And as we soon find out, he makes a shift and it works out a lot better for him. So, the problem with the movie I have is I don't think it reached full potential. It's kind of too lighthearted. And the whole blind game, like you said, is played out and it doesn't do anything with it and even him playing blind doesn't do it in a believable way like he he plays blind to a cartoonish level like there's a scene where he's in there's this woman that wants to have sex with him and she's talking to him and he's looking in the other direction i'm like motherfucker you ain't deaf you're blind <laughs> why are you looking left <laughs> i'm like come on i mean Woody, he's playing up the blindness to the point where it's like dude it's not even believable blindness it's just comedic blindness so I got a lot. Actually, I got some more positive points about the movie. But for me, the movie is just very light, very just okay. People just thought he was out, and I can kind of see why because his age and the movies, his comedies aren't killing it anymore. I think it's an okay movie, you know. But I, I can understand why people just think it's forgettable. And the cast ain't as great as his, the cast are usually always great. This time, the cast were not as great. Yeah, I mean. You nailed it, because to me, first time I thought that, okay, now that he has to direct the movie blind, that's going to be the whole gimmick, you know, that the big joke is that this guy's not even seeing what he's doing, yet everybody's like, oh my god, the greatest movie ever made, wow, how did you do it, you exactly, know, yeah. how did this happen, like, 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 they play it up, but no, that doesn't happen, then you think, okay, then it's a story about how the whole movie's a complete disaster and everything goes wrong that can go wrong. But even that doesn't really happen. Yeah. And the movie really runs out of steam because it has a strong beginning. It, it looks really different. You know, we have a lot of um, scenes establishing, you know, Tia Leone or Taya Leone's character in L.A. And you have these beautiful mansions and a, bit of a swimming pool and sunshine and it's so fresh and different. And you're, you're like, wow, this is some really nice cinematography, Woody. I'm really glad you go back to kind of thinking about people who live in other locations than Manhattan. And it's not a period piece. We're not going back in time. You know, you're looking around yourself and it's a bit of a critique. After all, you said he wants to get back into comedy. And we all know how funny it was back in the day when he used to take the piss out of people who live in L.A. And, you know, lazy liberals and all that stuff. But after that. All that stuff is abandoned. And to me, the movie only really picks up when they stop the comedy and actually get... They go a bit deeper with this character because he's seeing a therapist trying to get his vision back. And he reveals that what really bothers him is his relationship with his son. And up until that point, you didn't even know that this guy had a son. Yeah. And once again, I, I don't know, demonstrating some incredible range. Woody in this movie has a son who he has a troubled relationship with after his first divorce, because he was divorced twice, again, completely different from him. And this son in question somehow changed his name, <laughs> which again, just, you know, one shocker after the other. But Yeah, it really, you could really, I really felt like he was pulling from a place of real life with his relationship with his Ronan Farrell son. And I honestly felt like, like you said, that that is near the end of the movie and it's, he acts so well in that small part. It actually helps the movie a lot. So I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because that, that particular segment of the movie is very well, well done. This is the story. This is the story right here that this guy, when you introduce him, you would never see it coming that he has this personal baggage of, you know, family, an actual son. Then when you, you see him, everything makes sense why he's so traumatized and why he had all this stuff bottled up inside. And then him and his son try to rectify their relationship and get closer to each other is the strongest bit of the movie. And it comes in maybe 15 minutes before the end or something like that. I don't even know. It's very quick. And I'm like, why wasn't this in the movie more? It's a throwaway joke that the kid is a punk. So he has some shitty metal band and he eats live rats on stage. That's his shtick. I love and, you know, scumbag. It's, it's played for laughs. <laughs> oh, yeah. He changed his name to what? Captain Scumbag or scumbag something? X. Scumbag X. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> I actually laughed at that. And the guy's a good actor. The kid is actually a, the guy is a good actor because even after they make up, he's in another scene with the island, and you can see they're very alike. The kid's very articulate, and they have a good conversation. I'm like, damn, man, we we should have been we should this should have been a bigger part of the movie, like you said, because it would have given a lot more emotional resonance. But missed opportunity. Yeah, why didn't he make a movie about a son reconnect? Sorry, a father reconnecting with his son. Because that seems like what he wanted to do, even though he never really did that in real life. But if he, again, wanted to channel that, the plot twist should have been that the kid's actually Frank Sinatra's son. That could have been the last scene. Yeah, and that's when he gets... Man. Come on, and that, that. <laughs> and, and that's when he gets his vision back. He's like, oh, now I can clearly see. You know, but... That you're not mine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Awesome. He's, like, he's like, not my problem. <laughs> it's just like, ah, oh, finally, oh, I got rid of the responsibility. I don't even know, man. You know, Woody Allen is a bit of an enigma because he's good for that. that He doesn't gossip. He doesn't talk about his personal life. So we don't know how much he's bothered or not bothered by that, you know, troubled relationship. And we all we talked about how Dylan Farrow is a dickhead in real life anyway. So (laughs) fuck that guy. That's going to come up later too since he had a hand in covering his suit. Oh, again. uh, Yeah, of course. Of course he's uh, in the middle of this shit. Anything to promote his shitty fucking career. Mm. But long story short, that's the strongest bit in a movie comes way too late and yeah. this is my last criticism then i'll hand it back to you but yeah. another shocker ending that his ex-wife never stopped loving him so even though the movie doesn't really do well again another one of the few highlights is the critics reviews where from the not not even the critics review but the focus testing when they release the first cut of the film and the audiences see it to give a rip an early focus testing feedback and the focus group <laughs> they use expressions like <laughs> like what could improve the movie gasoline <laughs> and you know <laughs> and you know uh would you recommend this movie to a friend only if i was friends with hitler <laughs> And the, the other one was really good it's like how would you uh categorize the genre of the film american trash <laughs> Yeah, you're, these are the kind of comments you like to leave. And you know what? I'm going to jump in right here with you and bring up my last two criticisms as well. Number one, and a, another missed opportunity for all this talk about this mad fucking movie. I never got to see one clip of this fucking movie that he made. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Now, that would have been really good. I know it would be goofy, but for them to show none of it, I mean, even if we saw a five-minute clip of the screening, because at least they could have done that, but for you, for them to show us nothing... It was like, Woody, man, I mean, we're meant to see what you're not creating. That's part of the beauty of this mad movie. We're meant to see the madness you're creating with all these characters, and we don't see it. So we're just going off your word. And then one thing Woody Allen did come out and say, and this is the one piece of trivia I do know for a fact that Woody Allen put in the movie as an ode to his real life, is he did say, as a, one of the last parts of the movie, is that at this point in his career as well, America, American audiences did not like him. Again, they didn't like all the comedy shit, but this is when the European audience was having much more of an effect and was keeping them alive. And that's the last thing he says in the movie, that, oh, in France, they love me. You know, and here, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing, mate. In France, they love me. And that's how his career got the second rejuvenation, which we're going to get to in future movies. That was part of his inspiration for making this movie. Yeah, but he, I even have a problem with that. Right. And, and, and this is what it is. I don't know. I don't know if you notice this or you agree with me or not. Mm-hmm. It's not with the fact that he put that joke in that even though the movie's terrible, but they love it in France, which is kind of like at this point in time, like you said, the only place where his movies do well are in Europe, like places like France, you know, Western Europe. Except the UK, apparently. But <laughs> basically, that these are the only places his movies do well. And even so, he manages to, in the style of Stardust Memories, to diss these people saying, I just no made taste. a shitty fucking movie, <laughs> and yeah. y'all still love it. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like yeah. I directed some shit blind, yeah. and you guys still worship me for it. You call me a genius. No, you're right. It's a backhanded compliment. You are Yeah, right. but, but right. that's not my problem. I, I find it funny, you know. I'm okay. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cuss the fans out. You know, give it to them. Never listen to anybody anyway. You need to follow your own heart, especially when you're an artist. But my problem is that when the love story once again wraps up, and it's very similar to the last movie where 
you know, you have a female character who's very resilient and above it all for the entire movie. Then she's like, well, you're, you know, you, you're troublesome and you're short and you're this and that, but I just love you. You know, I just, I just can't help it. I, I'm still in love with you. And they get back together and they get their Hollywood ending as the uh, title. But the Hollywood ending is that she abandons her husband and career or her fiance and career and makes his dream come true to move to Paris with him so she can take care of him. And I'm like, what kind of ending is that? Like, mm. you establish this. There's even a line where she complains about, I'm, I want to establish myself as a woman in Hollywood and independent and all that. And I'm like, you made her drop all that in a heartbeat just to take care of your character, who's very miserable in the movie. Like, he says, like, I can't sleep alone. I need somebody to tuck me in. I can't go to bed without somebody being there and taking care of me. Like, he really need, is dependent on somebody to be more of a caretaker for him than he can be for someone else. So it's really an imbalance in the relationship. And the fact that he keeps talking about, oh, that my dream was to live with, in Paris with you, and that's what I really wanted. And I'm like, what about her dreams? What about what she wants? And in the end of the movie, none of that comes to fruition. They don't come to a compromise. It's just that she just drops everything like, oh, I still love him. And then just let's do whatever he says. Well, that's part of the problem I'm always going on about. You know, first of all, great point, you know, Simon the Feminist, which I, I'm sure the ladies do appreciate, so give yourself a pat on the back for that, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, well, you know, every dog has its day. But people do not buy Woody Allen in these leading roles, and what you pointed out is even worse, because it's worse. It's bad enough seeing Woody Allen still getting these women that he's just like, I just don't believe it. There's, you just reminded me, there are so many times this movie where Woody Allen is going in and out, like, let's just talk, let's just talk. Oh, why did you leave me? And she's, he's going on these tirades against her for like five minutes. And I'm like, no one would put up with this. And this woman, from the beginning of the movie to the end, just puts up with him going in and out of his little rants against, why did you cheat on me? And she's just standing there being silent. There's only one or two times where she kind of hits back. It's all like the last movie where uh, Helen, uh, Helen Hunt was going back and forth with him. She's just silent, like, let's into, oh, I'm going to go now. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? And one thing you said in the beginning, which I disagree with, is that you said in the beginning of the movie she had something to prove. To me, when the movie started, she just seemed like she wanted to help him just because. And even her husband said, you feel guilty? She's like, no, I don't feel guilty. He's just the right guy for the job. He's just, And I'm just like, do you seem like you really want to get back with him? Because you said he's such a terrible husband and all for the movie. She said, oh, you this, you that, you that. Why the fuck are you putting up with him then? Because he's got, he's giving you, as you said, nothing. He's doing absolutely nothing for her. But she's bending over backwards for him. Even when she finds out he's blind, that's the perfect time for her to lose the shit and say, you know what? Fuck you, because you're about to ruin everything. Nope. She's like, I'm going to do it anyway. Why? Because she loves him in a very unbelievable way. And it's just, you know, people weren't happy with that. And I just thought, Woody's done it so many times. He's put himself in these lead, lead male characters where he's the neurotic and the women love him anyway. You know, I'm just like, me, like the rest of the audience, I'm like, enough. <laughs> enough for the women, enough for you, Woody, and people are still, apart from that, no one at the comedy. So I'm right there with you. It's a problem. It's a massive problem. And I'm glad that even from the, from the next movie on, we're not going to see it anymore. We're not going to see Woody in this role. He's, I, don't mean, I don't mean to be ageist. He's too old for the role. It's not believable. He's not doing anything good for the women. But luckily, as we're going to see in future, that's all going to turn around. So... The only other two... I'm going to jump to two positive things. The two actors I like the most in the movie, which not even big actors, the Asian guy that was all the Alice's assistant, <laughs> he was funny. Even though he didn't have much to do, he made me laugh. Actually, the two Asian guys, the one that couldn't even speak English, now, you might think that's fucking racist because the guy da, 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 doesn't understand. But, <laughs> but, to my surprise... That is based off a real care. Woody Allen's cinematographer, filmographer, the last three movies was an Asian director and their relationship in this movie is an exaggeration of them in real life. So if you didn't know that, you'd probably think that's very racist. But nope, actually, I, I didn't get the filmographer's name right now, but he did the last four movies from Sweet and Low Down. Between that movie and this, Asian uh, filmographer's been his director and they've had that kind of relationship where he just exaggerated in this movie. I don't think people are going to know that and I think people might be upset by that, but... To me, those are the two standouts, and those aren't even named like major build characters. I don't know what that says about the casting of this movie, because the casting is very. This must be the most black casting Woody Allen's done. 
for the last 15 or 20 years. Yeah, man. Because those two characters are that you mentioned are colorful. I mean, you get a little bit, like so many missed opportunities. You get a little bit of the casting, which was fun. How terrible actors are reading. And you would think that, okay, with zero direction, you would get a little bit of parody of how actors are just obvious comedy. Like the c- scene sucks or they're without direction, so they have to improvise and they fall apart. You could have all these gimmicky characters like the Hollywood hunk, somebody who's like a really big star, and but he wants to branch out and do something different. So he works with this, you know, underdog director making this art movie as a comeback so he does it for like a really small paycheck and he's like i'm gonna act now and then you realize he can't fucking act or something like that i mean birdman did a whole movie like this yeah, a- about yeah. the theater and the stage and all the the colorful characters and you know ed norton in that movie was the was the troubled guy the guy who's very difficult to work with and he kind of played himself a little bit they had that inside joke of like oh he was a superhero too did he get fired or was it, or uh, or did he leave? And they were like, well, knowing him, it was probably both. You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. And so there's a much better ways to do this, and you don't see any of it, and that's why the characters are very bland. And right. Taya Leone tries her best, and she looks very different than something like Bad Boys, you know, where she was all about the the mystique and the hotness, and she was, you know, like an. Uh, improvised call girl in that where she's like well i'm just here visiting in the city but since my roommate's a hooker why not make some money (laughs) it's like i guess why not (laughs) but here you know she's very elegant and very successful that's why i thought she had something to prove because i'm like she has all she has the beauty the class the intelligence and the drive and this is a good opportunity for her and she knows she can do it because she's like, I can conquer my old mistakes. Like previously, I didn't, I couldn't control this guy, but now that I'm not his wife, I can bring the best out of him in my own benefit. But then, you know, obviously that goes nowhere. So, Woody Allen and these Hollywood movies, from Stardust to Celebrity to this, oh man, he's just. If he combined this idea with Celebrity with Leonardo DiCaprio, I think that would have been a fantastic classic movie. But Anyway, that's just you, you know what? Yeah, I was actually thinking about celebrity yesterday when I was watching this movie because I watched uh, I watched the Madonna video "Justify My Love," <laughs> which is my favorite Madonna song, and I'm like, that's where Woody got this from because that hotel room scene in Celebrity, shot black and white with the mm, orgy. I'm like, mm, this is probably mm. that, that's where the whole movie and the tone and all that came from from that probably that Madonna music video. So. I don't even know. Woody works in mysterious ways. <laughs> you say that like it's a god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was the ironic joke. But yeah. I- I- enough about this movie. Yeah. The, the whole the whole big point is that they do a little bit of uh, self-referencing and name-dropping in terms of the big names in Hollywood. And actually, it's uh, Deborah Messing's character who says, oh, you know, I can't take a single day off a of theater because... Probably that's gonna be the day when Steven Spielberg or oh, Harvey that was so or funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah or Harvey Weinstein comes around. Oh. <laughs> As we all know, now it turned out that Harvey Weinstein did want it to come a lot when it came to actresses. <laughs> like that was his main mo that he would hook up, hook you know he would hook up all these young guys, pimp them out, greenlight their scripts in the indie boom of the '90s Miramax era. Oh, which is mostly due to Quentin Tarantino. Let's be honest. You know that's that that was the when uh, Pulp Fiction crossed a hundred million dollars. That's when everybody was chasing. And Harvey Weinstein was very beloved amongst these young guys, including Matt Damon and Ben Affleck with uh, Good Will Hunting. Yeah. We're like, oh, we got our first shot, and we love this guy, and he's doing he's greenlighting all these different movies where everybody else is trying to do the same old shtick and. He sits inside and outside of a studio system at the same time, where in reality, he's basically a sex offender. He was a pervert who was in the, the, you know, surrounded himself with young talent and then became the best friend of the upcoming actors. Mm. So that attracted a lot of actresses who wanted to come into the industry, get into the, the business, or, you know, they want to keep their careers and be part of what was then a success story. So he got the best of all worlds. He got popular actresses, unknown actresses, new actresses, established actresses. Everybody wanted to be 
in his production house, and he made it very clear that he's not opposed to asking for favors for getting into his films. Hmm. And that's where everything blew up apparently 20 years too late, because I wish this would have come out in the 90s, but now we know that he touched women, he harassed women, he made all sorts of comments, flashed himself, invited them to dodgy casting scenarios, trying to groom them and harass them into sexual favors and a bunch of shit where I wouldn't mind him being thrown down elevator shaft personally but <laughs> I like the way Skype just robot aside your voice when you said that and we didn't even transition to that but since we're on the topic yeah I don't know maybe his mother's name is Marfa or something that's why Ben Affleck got so he got on with him for so many years yeah, it was it was so weird when they brought up Harvey Weinstein in this movie. Like, he's such a big force in Hollywood. That, you know, it's it's the timing that was just so funny. But well, so ironic. Your boy Woody had something to say about it as well. Woody Allen. Well, before we get to it, just I want to say this. First of all, if we look at current scandals and all this stuff, there's a lot of this stuff happening. Where this happened with Cosby in the UK. This happened with uh, Ralph Harris where these guys are being brought up on charges with stuff they did in the 80s and the 70s, stuff like that is happening a lot now. If you're a fan of YouTube, you heard about the screen junkies, Andy Signore, big popular geek. It's been out for the same the same day. I think that, yeah, actually a couple of days before. Then the screen junkies guy, it's just, it just permeates all of entertainment. And again, people call it an open secret. I just always thought it was part of the core. Like, you, you hear these things. They've even made movies about shit like this about you know young actresses having to do female actresses having to do things and it's sad Woody Allen throwing his opinion out there I don't want to paraphrase and I really should get the quotes up but again I'll just say uh, just in case I misquote Woody uh, this is kind of a legend or whatever but from the headlines I saw first of all Woody Allen said that this kind of thing he doesn't want this to lead to a witch hunt because the next thing you know you can't even wink at women at the office because then they're gonna it's got he really first of all <laughs> first of all Woody Allen period should just stay the fuck out of it because people we did the whole fucking nearly two hour podcast on this guy and his allegations people want Woody Allen gone people in his own family want his want him gone his son Ronald Farrell I think he was the one that wrote the masterpiece uh, journalistic thing that started this whole thing with Harvey Weinstein his own son and then Woody wants to voice his opinions on it too so Woody's got slammed for even saying shit. He had to come out again with a rebuttal saying that he's a, now saying Harvey Weinstein, he's a, he's a very sick man. Woody Allen, why don't you just shut the fuck up? Because Woody Allen's latest movie was just screamed at the, um, what is it, Wonder Wheel, was just screamed at the uh, Cannes Film Festival, whatever. It got scathing reviews. It's a fucking mess. So Nah, nah, nah. It has Justin Timberlake in it, so it can't be that bad. But to me, this is the funniest thing. Woody Allen doesn't do interviews. That guy does not do interviews and he doesn't comment. He doesn't care about what's mm, going on in the world, mm, pop culture. Yeah. He keeps his mouth shut. What? Except, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, this guy got, gets destroyed. I mean, it, it's, it's a typical, you know, snowball effect where one actress comes out and the next thing, you know, 20 more actresses come out and it's clear as daylight that he's fucking guilty. And that's when Woody comes out and makes a statement and, I knew that he didn't say anything, you know, terrible. He yeah. said something reasonable, like, there's always a danger that these things get out of hand, and, you know, let's focus on the actual crime and Harvey Weinstein and not get everybody riled up to take advantage of the situation and promote their own name, like <laughs> Frank Sinatra's son, <laughs> you know. Like, let's not turn it into a, a witch hunt. Let's not get, you know, the pitchforks and knives and torches out. But, you know, let's try to actually convict Harvey Weinstein at this point. Even so, he just got hate. And I knew he was going to get hate. In fact, I had heard from various girls that I talked to about it. That, and they said that, oh, did you hear? What, what is your boy doing? Why didn't you tell? I was like, who, which one of my boys? It's like, Woody Allen is defending Harvey Weinstein. How could he do that? I'm like, <laughs> what am I, his keeper? How the fuck should I know? He didn't, he didn't ask me about it. Yeah. <laughs> How am I responsible? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure he didn't defend him. I'm pretty sure he just said, let's not turn into a witch hunt. But that was enough for everybody to jump on his back and like, boo. It wasn't. And here's the thing. I understand that his shit's already out there. So... Your boy Ben Affleck, he said some shit where you're like, dude, you of all people want to talk with me, no, you probably done some shit. Woody Allen, his shit's already out there. So 
I understand what you thought. You, I got nothing to lose, or I don't need to feel away because I'm already in the hot zone. It's just not. It's not good. It wasn't a good idea to jump in the race anyway. And to be honest with you, maybe it was just some interview. You know, his movie's out. They could have just, you know, got him on red carpet, asked his opinion because it's a Hollywood scandal. So, again, he probably just said it in passing and they just made it a headline. And he doesn't give a fuck. Woody Allen, we all know, he just, generally, he doesn't really give a shit. It, but, he, you know, I just think he was cornered to say that. I'm not defending him. I'll just reiterate. He should have said the fuck out of it. He really should have. But, you know. He's got yeah, but, 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 but didn't we talk about something in a related scandal how, you know, Woody sh should not, I don't even know, but I think because so many people came out out of the rapist and sex offender closet lately that we were talking about that the worst thing Woody could do is just do another 60 minutes, yeah. you know, another CNN special where they were like, yeah, this guy did all these horrible things and he assaulted women and verbally abused them and, and let, you know, irreparable damage and trauma to them and Woody's just sitting there like <laughs> yes continue <laughs> that is true I understand it's like, it's like, yeah. yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 I acknowledge that yeah yeah <laughs> no, everybody's like you're supposed to say that sounds terrible like yeah. well, the poor thing and he's like yeah continue <laughs> Guys, you you have to oh see you have to see the interview because honestly, <laughs> and and he acted like that when he himself was being accused. And I understand where he's coming from because I always complain about that that some people use it as a tool for revenge. Yeah. And then when actual victims who have a very difficult time coming out into the open with it because there's a huge backlash, they call them liars. These shitty cases, like the one with, that Woody Allen had discredits other people's legitimate cases sure. and in the courtrooms they actually bring it up they bring it up how oh you know some people are just after money some people just want notoriety and why didn't you say anything beforehand if this happened 10 years ago why didn't you speak 10 years ago why didn't you say something how did he get away with it did nobody else kn knew if everybody else knew why didn't they say something you know so it's very difficult to do so i understand where Rudy was coming from but he really should have asked his wife to make the statement you know mm. that's what he should have done well he came later with a rebuttal you know with a he's a sick yeah, man yeah yeah when soon he probably saw saw the headline and he was like come over here what did you do you crazy? No, no, no. You gonna? And what he's like? I, I, I don't know. I was just, you know, I was just uh, talking, and uh, yeah. she was like, no, 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 no. You gonna write? You're a writer, so start typing. Here's your little 1940s typewriter. Start mm. typing a statement, and you gonna, you gonna apologize and make this right. But mm. uh, Ben Affleck, that's comedy gold right there. See, that's my favorite part of this whole thing. How he tried to come out and do the right thing of saying like, yeah, Harvey Weinstein's a pig. And the response was like, wait a minute. Fuck you, Ben Affleck. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. With like all these tapes of him. And see, this proves my point about oversensitivity and all these social justice warriors. And again, Woody's point as well with a witch hunt. Because the funniest thing is, everything they showed about Ben Affleck being a pervert and, you know, groping women and looking at their, you know... Uh, cleavages and doing interviews where he's like talking about it you should take your titties out or something yeah that's all out in the public he's not doing it in, like in a hotel room on the download that's like live on the red carpet from mtv news sure. you know that's all available footage in fact your boys at screen junkies when they were parodying him when he got cast as Batman, yeah. half of that stuff is in the gag reel of best of ben affleck and yeah. nobody said anything mm. but nowadays in just two, three years, people got so oversensitive and they can use this to boost their Twitter and their followers and turn it into a scandal that him coming out now after his own brother got accused and both him and Matt Damon were real quiet about that. Yeah. Again, his brother's case is actually kind of like a closed case. I mean, that yeah. they actually paid the girls to keep quiet, you yep. know, because... Mm -hmm. They had evidence and everything, and that didn't look too good. And Ben Affleck wasn't like in the front line saying, "Yeah, my brother is a pig." Yeah, fuck him. That he really should have kept his mouth shut. But you brought an excellent point where people just want to take him down because Matt Damon was again along for the ride with the Harvey Weinstein and all this stuff, and he kept his mouth shut. Then 
And from what I understand, he's keeping his mouth shut now. Nobody throwing him under the bus. Believe me, this is the beginning. I'm telling you, there's people that have got away for time. And some some people might let it go. But I'm telling you, man, this is the beginning. And let me tell you something. Not just the past, present and future. Because we've set new presidents here. Going back and getting people who think they got away with it. It's, it's in now. I'm not saying there's something wrong with it. But people are fucking sweating. <laughs> I'm sure there are tons of celebrities, directors, actors, producers, writers. They are sweating fucking bullets. And, you know, people might even be getting blackmail at this point. And, you know, it's all good for <laughs> equality. It's all good. It's going to, you know, the thing I like about it, and to wrap this up, it's going to change the landscape. I'm going to make things more fair. And it's really cool. I'm gonna, for the, It's for the better. If I had a daughter, if I had a cousin, you know, I know your significant other is an actress as well. So some good can come out of this horrible situation and it's going to change a lot of things in Hollywood. Apparently, there's already changes being made, which is cool. But again, you know, I think there's going to there's gonna be some back and forth. I don't even want to... I was going to say something, but I don't want to sound like I'm defending this possible witch hunt, but, you know, we'll, let's just see how it goes. But let's wrap this one up because we've gone on long enough about this one. Last thing I didn't say about the movie Hollywood ending is that although me and Simon gave our opinions, if you go on to watch IMDb, again... This is the trail of Woody Allen's early 2000 comedies. People didn't like it. Again, this is the scores are below fives. They don't like the comedies. And believe me, when it ends, it ends. And it's going to be a turn off for Woody. But we'll get there when we get there. Simon, I'm going to let you go. Thank you for joining me on this one as always. That's all good. Uh, I'm going to maybe send some cookies to Ben Affleck, who's in rehab. Oh, I just need to look up online uh, some store that puts Buttman on the top of the mo- <laughs> top of the cake or something. I can't. It's gonna be something that he he must do in the future. That's gonna redeem. He's gonna make. He's gonna make your favorite movie one day, Sam. All right, let's just see. Let's just. See. He should make a movie about Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> the funny, biopic. There's actually someone. I forgot who it was. Someone was actually making, uh, uh, and actually, I think it was. Uh, believe it or not, I think it was. Uh, uh, what's Gambit? The actor's playing Gambit. Same again. Oh, not not the Kitch of Death, but actually Channing Tatum. Yeah, Channing Tatum was actually. I think he was writing a script to Harvey Weinstein about some Hollywood sexual, and now. He said to just throw that away. So how ironic is that? But anyway, guys, before we go off topic anymore, thank you for listening. If you like the discussion, you like us going off topic, check out the channel because we've had a lot of discussions like this. To be honest with you, this is kind of what we used to do on that podcast 19 that might come back in future when we're done with this fucking retrospective. But for now, let's just get this out of the way. Guys, subscribe to the channel. Thanks for listening on the podcast. All the links to everything we said will be down in the description. And we're going to leave you guys. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next recording.